And everyone. Okay. All right. Are we streaming? Yeah, we're all set to go when you're ready. Matt, can you take? Can you turn your your camera off, if possible? Thanks. Um. Sorry, it's just I've got so many screens open. Um, good evening and welcome to this virtual meeting of North Tyneside Council's Children, Education and Skills Subcommittee. Um, following, guide, following the introduction of regulations by the government um, enabling local authorities to conduct their meetings remotely in light of the ongoing pandemic. Um, following this, a decision by the Overview and Scrutiny and Policy Development Committee, all subcommittee meetings are now being streamed live on the Council's YouTube channel to enable members of the press and public to observe the meeting. My name is Matthew Thurler, I'm chair of this um, subcommittee. Um, before, we, before we get on the, the items on the agenda, I'd like to introduce um, those present here tonight, those members of the committee who are here tonight. Um, so if I call your name, um, would you please turn on your microphone and your video and just introduce yourself. Councillor Trish Brady, Good evening, Councillor Brady, Councillor for Northumberland Ward. Councillor Sean Brockbank. I'm assuming Councillor Brockbank isn't with us tonight. Councillor Joan Cassidy. Hi, Joan Cassidy, Councillor for Wheatslade Ward. Councillor Nigel Hushcroft. Hi, good evening. Councillor Nigel Hushcroft from Northumberland Board. Councillor Karen Lee. Hello, good evening. Karen Lee here, Councillor for Colour Coats. We have apologies from Councillor Maureen Mann. Councillor Andy Newman. Evening, evening and all, Councillor Andy Newman, Northumberland Ward. Councillor Pat Oliver. Good evening, everybody. Pat Oliver, Councillor for Benton Ward and Deputy Chair of this committee. Councillor Erin Parker Leonard. Good evening, Councillor for Killingworth Ward. Erin Parker Leonard, thank you. Councillor Stephen Phillips. Hi, Chair. Uh, Councillor Stephen Phillips, Councillor for Battle Hill Ward. Councillor Matt Wilson. Hi, Councillor Matt Wilson, Preston Ward in North Shields. Mrs Michelle Ward. I'm assuming she's not with us tonight. So, so, sorry, I am. Can you hear oh, me? Sorry. <laughs> took my camera off but I didn't take the mic off sorry um I should be used to doing this I'm sitting doing it all day every day sorry but it's uh Michelle here parent governor representative hi yeah um Mr Stephen Fallon hi there I'm um, Stephen Fallon representing the Catholic Church um the Reverend Michael Vine I don't think we're host tonight. Uh, Councillor Sean Brockbank's just joined us. I have indeed, yeah. Sean Brockbank, um, the councillor for Monkseaton South. And we will also ask the officers to introduce themselves. Um, Nick Flavel. Uh, good evening, councillors. My name is uh, Nick Flavel. I'm senior manager for quality assurance with North Tyneside Council, and I've had the privilege of being lead officer for this uh, sub Committee over the past three years. Julie Firth, is she with us tonight? 
Uh, Chair, Julie Firth uh, gives her apologies and I will uh, be uh, presenting uh, the report on behalf of uh, Jodie Henderson, who uh, regrettably at short notice also gives her apologies. That's fine. Um, Victoria McLeod. Hi, Victoria McLeod. I'm the Senior Manager for the Front Door Services and the Safe and Supported Social Work Teams in North Tyneside. Dawn Hodgson. Good evening, I'm Dawn Hodgson and I'm the Service Manager for the Front Door at North Tyneside. Thank you, everyone. Um, just some housekeeping rules. Um, please turn off your microphones and cameras when you're not speaking. Um, only speak when invited to do so. Um, and activate your microphone and camera before speaking. I know I know we don't always remember, me, me included, me especially rather. Um, if you do want to speak, um, please use the hand raising function um, or alternative, you can you can put it in the chat or if you don't have any, any of those, um, just wave or, or interrupt the meeting. Um, just as long as everyone has a chance to, to ask questions and, and make comments. Um, we'll begin the meeting. Um, I'll ask if there's any apologies. Um, only Chair from Councillor Madden that you've previously mentioned. So there's only there's only Councillor uh, Molly Madden, there's no one else that anyone else would like to declare. Great. Um, do, I'm assuming we don't have any substitute members. No, none that I'm aware of, no. Great. Do we have any declarations of interest? Hi, Chair. Yes, I'm a foster carer for a neighbouring local authority. Great, thank you. Are there any other declarations? Hi, hi, Church. Uh, Councillor Brock Banker. I'm a registered social worker and I work for uh, Calf Castle as a guardian. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Perfect. Um, can we confirm the minutes of the meeting that was held on the 23rd of January 20? Sorry. Um, Agreed. Sorry. <laughs> thank you from the, the previous meetings and um, the previous meeting um which was i think was quite a long time ago so does everyone have to agree those agreed 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 um, great thank you um our first report is regarding corporate parenting activity during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um Nick, you're gonna um do the report for this this um report. Um can I ask if people have questions or comments unless it's to clarify something in the report or something Nick said, can we keep questions and comments until after Nick is finished? Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair. And can I again um, apologise on behalf of my colleague um, uh, Jodie Henderson, who is the senior manager with responsibility for um, corporate parenting um, and, and, and children in care within the authority. Unfortunately, a very short uh, notice at about five past five, she um, indicated she was unable to attend and uh, present this uh, report. So I do so um, on her behalf. Um, I think members uh, will recollect that um, uh, officers provided an overview uh, report in relation to the impact of the pandemic upon uh, services, including uh, safeguarding uh, child protection and um, early help uh, services um, to an earlier committee meeting. And there was um, a, a, a not unreasonable challenge about the specific impact of the pandemic on our corporate parenting responsibilities as a council and how services and officers had responded. And it was on that basis that um, uh, Jody uh, put together quite a lengthy report to give you an, an overview and context of the work that has been um, ongoing. Um, I suppose what I would say from the outset is um, officers um, uh, come uh, to uh, 
the task of responding to the pandemic, I hope with humility in that there uh, is absolutely no rule book um, or, or, or guidance really to the way in which we have respond. We are learning as we go along. There are things we would have uh, definitely done uh, differently, but there are also things um, I hope uh, councillors that we could be uh, incredibly proud of um, on behalf of the, the, the council's response uh, during the pandemic. Uh, Rather than go through the report um, uh, line by line, it's a lengthy report. You'll be um, relieved to know what I intend to do is, is cover the, the, the highlights and then um, uh, take the opportunity to respond to uh, members' questions. Um, I think it is a, a helpful starting point that when we talk about um, children in care, um, uh, we are always talking about a cohort of about 300 uh, children that um, have been temporarily or permanently removed from the care of birth families and uh, we have overriding responsibility uh, to support their care, um, hopefully to return the vast majority to the, the full-time safe care of, of their birth family. Um, but for some, we will have ongoing, enduring um, responsibility uh, for their care because it's it's not possible or safe for them to return. And for those children and young people, we have an ongoing responsibility when they uh, um, move um, to uh, live um, uh, semi or fully independently of the council as former children in care, care leavers. Our um, responsibilities to them continue. And if we have 300 children in care, we always have about half um, uh, circa 150, 160, who we have those ongoing responsibilities to. So although um, a relatively small number of children and young people, a very significant group of children and uh, young people uh, uh, that the council has responsibility um, for. Thematically, um, Jody has arranged a report to consider uh, fostering uh, first, and I think that that, that is appropriate because uh, the vast majority of children and young people with whom we have uh, responsibility and care for are within uh, foster care. And uh, of those children and young people, um, a significant number are uh, uh, cared for by uh, relatives or kinship uh, carers, those within their network, um, and we would um, we would support those uh, those uh, kinship carers to uh, care for them. Um, as you can uh, see, one of the, the the strengths of the service is that um, uh, we have of um, nearly two, uh, just over two thirds of the children in care are in foster care, and of those, um, just under half are within kinship care replacements. Um, that provides um, that provides the uh, um, the children and young people with um, the opportunity to be cared for by people who are not strangers to them particularly if they have been removed from parental care um, in circumstances of, uh, uh, of trauma through neglect or abuse that minimizes the disruption to their lives they are often stay within their local uh, community maintaining the opportunities uh, for them to uh, for them to be um, 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 uh, disrupted um, from their education, from their friendship groups, and will maintain uh, contact with their parents and carers during that time. I want to reassure members that those um, those opportunities to be placed where possible with kinship carers have continued during uh, COVID, and the local authority always looks to place um, with um, within the network of a family, if at all possible. Um, and one thing that uh, that Jody's uh, paper um, omitted to mention because of the time that it was written is in fact there has been some national interest in our work around um, uh, supporting children within their network and there is a piece of research ongoing which hopefully we will be able to bring to uh, officers will be able to report to the committee in due course. Foster carers have been incredibly stoic um, it's the phrase that um, I, I think uh, stands out within uh, within the report. Um, as you can appreciate, um, the national guidance is that we shouldn't have strangers within our homes, that we should um, hunker down during the time of the pandemic. And clearly, um, um, for residents within North Tyneside who are foster carers, um, to the contrary, they have welcomed children and young people into their homes and have done so um, uh, despite 
the risks that may be associated with that. Social workers have assured that we've managed those risks as far as we are able. Um, but I have to say, as Jody makes clear, it is to the absolute credit of foster carers that they have been willing to do so. Um, mm. We've been th with the pandemic for some time, but you can uh, appreciate, colleagues, um, the real nervousness that there was around um, having strangers within your home in those early months of the pandemic. And yet our fostering community continued to put the safety and welfare of children and young people first and when uh, we needed to place children uh, within our fostering community uh, they were that they welcomed those children into their homes and I, I, I do hope that, that members would acknowledge um, the commitment um, and the courage um, that that took um, particularly in those those early months. Um, we are also aware that um, uh, and I think members are aware that we continue to want to expand our fostering community to reduce the number of children and young people who have to go further afield and to reduce the costs to the council of um, of um, foster care placements, which are not council uh, placements. And I, I think members are well versed on the, the challenges that that, that brings. Um, I'm delighted to say that during uh, the, the, the pandemic, we have continued to actively recruit um, foster carers. Um, that was a decision that was taken by officers. Um, but actually, I think the right one, I think uh, within the pandemic for some people, um, it, it has given them the opportunity to rethink their, their, their life choices. Um, and uh, for some, um, it has meant that they have decided to make a, a career change and has made a decision to become part of the fostering community. And it was important that the council uh, kept pace and kept ahead of, 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 of that so that um, uh, where there are expressions of interest by those who are interested in fostering with North Tyneside, that we were able to continue to recruit. Most of that recruitment has been done uh, virtually. Um, and all of it done safely. But I'm delighted to say, as as as, as Jody pointed out, we have welcomed new uh, carers to our fostering community during that time, and that's strategically important um, for uh, children's services as we continue to look to increase our fostering um, community. In terms of um, in terms of the uh, the next thematic area of the report, it relates to um, the, the the children's homes uh, uh, with um, and the the impact of COVID upon that. Um, can I say I will not be able to do uh, the same justice to this element of the report that Jody would have done. Uh, safe to say that it's an incredibly complex area um, of, of children's services. We, we own and operate a number of children's homes with a large staff group um, caring for some of the more difficult and challenging uh, young people within the within the borough and some definitely some of the more vulnerable children and young people uh, within the borough. All the children's homes have remained um, active and open throughout the pandemic, which is to the credit of the staff group. The children's homes have had to respond to COVID positive children and young people, COVID positive um, uh, staff members, um, a reduction in the uh, number of available staff due to shielding, due to a, a range of, of, of impacts of the pandemic. And yet, um, through thick or thin, as I'm sure Jody would have said better than I could, they have continued to maintain services and care of children um, and, and young people throughout. Um, you will be aware there are a number of children's homes which have um, different areas um, of focus and Jody um, details those. Um, some of our children's homes have specific uh, um, responsibility to children with disabilities or um, uh, children um, uh, with um, um, uh, um, additional needs through um, through autism and learning disabilities. Um, and I'm delighted to say that um, I'm, I'm delighted to say that during the period of the, the pandemic, we were able to open the, the Lime, Lime Tree House Children's Home. Um, and um, begin um, a long, uh, a long planned uh, uh, process of changing the um, the Heatherfield Muse children's home and re uh, repurposing it. Um, and Jody goes into some of the details um, about ab about those. 
Um, we were conscious as officers that we have a small number of children and young people who are outside of the geographical area in children's homes, which are not uh, our own and run uh, by um, by other providers. And one of the things that we've uh, been very clear on during the pandemic is to make sure we are th that we are monitoring the health and, and well-being of our children that we have um, corporate parenting responsibility um, for within those homes. And in fact, we have done that in a, in, in a range of ways, clearly articulating our expectations, promotion of health, promotion of um, education, um, and also um, closely monitored the quality of provision in terms of their staffing ratios and um, their ability to deliver in COVID as well. And that has uh, been quite a challenge as, as you can appreciate, um, and um, I'm delighted to say that, that we have um, not had issues with our uh, providers over the course of the over the course of the pandemic uh, to date. And that is that is um, in contrast to, to some of our peer local authorities um, as well. Um, during the um, during the course of the uh, pandemic, um, Clearly, you will be aware there have been national concerns around the education and well-being of children and young people who were unable to access education. As a corporate parent, we um, as, the, as children's services would want um, um, high quality education during um, uh, the closure of schools for children and young people that we that we have responsibility for. And the focus of that support has been through um, uh, the, the Hive team, previously known as the RELAC team, with our virtual head teacher, uh, Jane Pickthall, uh, monitoring and supporting children and young people, the provision of laptops, um, uh, making sure that our carers are challenging when the education provision from um, their, their school has not been the online provision has, has not been what it was um, and where it has been appropriate encouraging children and young people to attend um, school provision if available as um, as vulnerable children it has been a mix it has been a, a diversity not all children in care have attended school as vulnerable children and um, that there have been uh, decisions on a child by child basis um, but we have been very active in ensuring that children vulnerable by virtue of being children in care with the life experience that they have have not been unduly impacted uh, by the pandemic and uh, to some extent having um, the council as a corporate parent actively supporting their education having um, a, a virtual head teacher, very able and enthusiastic head teacher in Jane Pickthall, I think has 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 provided some additional support when for all our children and young people it has been an incredibly challenging year to date. Um, it's important that, that members are aware, as I said, that for all our corporate parenting responsibilities, we have enduring responsibilities uh, to those who have recently been in our care and are making their way within uh, the, the world through our care leaving service, which is uh, based at the Riverside uh, Centre just by the parks. Um, Children who have uh, left care and care leavers are allocated a uh, personal advisor, which is um, all those questions um, from um, how to make spaghetti bolognese through to um, employment um, uh, um, opportunities, through to how to um, get a driving license and uh, those range of things that, that, that our, our, our older young people as, as parents, those questions that are asked that support network isn't necessarily available within young people's families. So we, we do that through an amazing staff group who befriend, support, mentor, um, care for um, young people as they make their way in the world as well. One of the exciting things that has happened in um, uh, in the pandemic has been a partnership with um, Quorum Voice, to um, which is a national advocacy service to really drill down on the experiences of our care leavers 
based on some of the good work that um, had been undertaken by the service. Um, and at the very uh, towards the very end of Jodie's report, um, it's really interesting what our young people are saying about the services that have been um, uh, provided. And Jodie's report is honest. There are there are areas of strength, but there are clearly also areas of development. And it may be um, that um, the committee would invite further further um, discussion and feedback in the future around some of the things that, that Jody references. So for example, um, there's real strengths in the personal advisors, that staff group, um, the relationships that they have with our young people, um, the housing options, which will clearly be close to, to, to many members' hearts as well within the borough, um, their safety and their, their understanding of their journey in care. However, our young people are telling us that their mental health and well-being at times needs more support. I think that's understandable. Um, and I think officers are really uh, would acknowledge that, um, that um, their abilities to manage financially, the support that we're able to provide them could be uh, further supported um, and their, their, their sense of achievement and support networks could be uh, further supported as well. So, again, um, there are clearly areas uh, for development and it's great whenever we ask young people about the quality of services, not only do they tell us what works, they are very clear what doesn't work and how we can um, improve our services. The final area that uh, Jody just uh, refers to is um, our continued uh, monitoring of the the, the COVID, uh, the impact of COVID on our services. And I suppose, uh, members, that's really where I where, where I started the, the presentation. Um, all officers would be aware that there are things that we would um, uh, be proud of during the, the pandemic, the continuity of the vast, vast majority of care arrangements, children being accommodated into care where they needed um, uh, care for their own safety and the support that has been provided. But undoubtedly, there are there is um, uh, learning. Um, that we would take forward. As I said, there is no rule book to this. Um, we uh, are in for a slog. We realise that we will continue to have to work in ways we never expected to work with our children in care over the months um, ahead. Um, I would just want to commend particularly um, uh, to members the, the staff that have provided day-to-day -day care within our residential children's homes for children and young people and um, uh, and equally our foster carers who um, have just shown how incredibly committed they are to children and young people and whilst most of us kept the door firmly shut um, door, during uh, Covid um, uh, a number of our foster carers opened their door to risk to welcome into their care children and young people from different households um, to ensure and to contribute to safety planning for those for those children. Uh, thank you for listening, Chair. Thanks, Nick. And I think all the members of the committee realise how difficult the last 10 months have been for, for you and your staff in the service. I think um, from this report and the, the previous reports we've had about corporate and um, parent, and it does sound like the service has really stepped up and met the challenge. So that's really encouraging. Yeah. Um, do we have any questions from members of the committee? Councillor Oliver. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I will get there. Have I got there yet? Yeah. Um, a couple of questions, Nick, please. Um, little concerned about the age of the children placed outside the borough. Um, are there plans to bring them back when that is possible? And, and how does it work with family contact? What, what sort of distances are we talking about? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Really, really um, significant challenge um, because we would always start from the perspective, as uh, I think I've um, uh, mentioned to uh, members before, that we would want all children and young people within the borough because it's where they're from. 
it's where their community ties are and significantly it is where their um, um, it is where their family is and for, for um, almost all children and young people that continuity of community education and the opportunity safely to see their their, their family members is important so why do we ever um, well, I suppose the honest answer, uh, 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 place children out of area, I suppose the, the honest answer is the sufficiency, the number of placements that, that we have available, which is why I said I, I, I hope members would see there's real strength in the continuation of the recruitment of foster carers during the pandemic. However, um, I think it is my my. Um, observation is that there will always be a very small need for placements out of the area, whether where there is a specific need of a young person. That might be a complex health need. Yeah. Is that because um, of specific disabilities or specific needs? Uh, yes, councillor. So, the, um, so, so the two, the two that I would, the, the two that I would propose would be where there is a complex health need, and there simply isn't the provision within within the borough. I think it's 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 a fair comment. Could there be? But I think that would be one one uh, area. The other area is where um, it is intentional, and we are trying to disrupt some of the um, impact of being within the community for that child or young person particularly those where there is significant and serious criminal exploitation mm -hmm. um, but whenever a child or young person goes out we would want to minimize the distance um, and we will go to significant lengths to continue to promote family time which is uh, used to be known as contact but the time that they spend with their, their birth family um, we also um, are very reluctant because where possible we don't want to disrupt education because that would just be a, a layering of of uh, more trauma and uh, more emotional impact on a child or young person. Um, so we will look to it within um, within the broad remit of, of of corporate challenge. Clearly, there are additional costs, but I would want um, to a child going out out of area. But I would also s always start from the perspective of the child and their lived experience. And where possible, we want them as close to home as possible. Lovely. Thanks for that explanation, Nick. Just one more, if that's OK. Um, mental health. Um, during the pandemic, I'm guessing children's mental health has been affected badly. Um, and can I, you know, we've talked about acronyms. What's HIVE? Yeah. Now, re remind me, health, something virtual education what's the i maybe vicky mcleod can help me so they got a new name because uh relac had um looked after children so it's raising a health and education of looked after children the right. lack bit our children and young people quite rightly felt was pejorative um lack as in looked after children yeah. but but was yeah. felt that it connoted they lacked something so um we now refer to our looked after children as children in care which is something that they uh, preferred, um, and that meant we um, there was a there was a decision to change the name. Um, but you've put me on the spot, and I can't remember the I. I, I do apologise, Nick. <laughs> uh, send an email out; that would be absolutely great. So, just to get back to young people's mental health, has there been an impact on it? And if there has, which I suspect the answer is yes, have you been able to? Um, get services for those young people for example it comes has that been necessary and has there been a waiting list and etc etc um so i think councillor yes to all of the above so we are absolutely aware um um with many officers and, and children's services um uh, staff as parents as well that the pandemic has had an impact on the emotional well-being of children and young people and i think it will be um, a number of years um, um, and probably global research to understand the true impact of yeah. that. And the, the 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 most protective thing that we have been able to achieve, as Jodie points out, is continuity of care. Um, the last thing that uh, children's services wanted was a number of disruptions in placements. If we've managed, and almost in all cases, to continue. Um, to maintain continuity of care where it's been safe to do so education has been the biggest factor 
as I'm sure you'll 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 be aware nationally. Uh, it's been a real challenge. I think in the early months of the lockdown, we are all aware that um, a significant number of education um, um, uh, establishments decided um, to manage the risk that they would move to online learning. For vulnerable children and young people, that was an issue. Um, and therefore, um, um, as I said, where we have been able to do so, we have encouraged real live attendance as vulnerable children within education settings. However, it, it is not uninteresting that for some of our more complex children and young people, they've really valued online learning. They have valued the opportunity not to be in a school setting, in a competitive setting with with a significant, uh, with, you know, with a large group of other children and young people, which 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 can be quite difficult for them. Um, so it, it's quite mixed. The last thing you've said is is about uh, CAMS. What I would say is that CAMS is very much at, uh, on the continuum of support provided where there are a significant uh, um, emotional well-being issues that may have tipped into mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, support has been provided across the continuum. Uh, the provision of laptops, um, continuity of care, the continuation of family time, so that during lockdown, children and young people were seeing their um, were, were seeing their birth family regularly and appropriately. There have been a range of things, um, activities, um, uh, um, all of those things across the, the group. But I, I, I think it will be some time until for children's services to fully understand the impact. And, and regrettably, of course, we're not through it yet. Um, and of course, we have an education lockdown um, until half term. And I think uh, uh, we're all waiting to see what the national decision will be beyond that. Okay. Thanks. And can I just add my congratulations to all of our foster parents, you know, thank them for what they do. And also on Lime Tree House, I think that's an excellent move. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Parker Leonard, next. Hey, uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Nick, for that report. Um, just a, a question that kind of goes off the back of Pat's. I um, also want to say, I think, I have to say foster care. I think foster carers are doing a great job. I am one. But um, also the children's home staff, I think they're doing an amazing job. I know I've worked in those in the past and I think um, the job they do is hard enough as it is, um, never mind a, a global pandemic. Um, I wondered about, um, I know there's exemptions, obviously, for children who don't live with their birth parents that they can they can have cont contact or family time for those who are looked after um, and I wondered if you've been able to manage that in comparison with foster carers who are possibly vulnerable maybe older or maybe have health issues um, and I wondered also if there was any request or pressure put on central government to have um, testing for the residential childcare staff so those are my two questions Thank you, councillor. So on the um, on the, the, the second issue, which is around testing, absolutely, our voice has gone along with several other voices that in order to manage what's a fairly dynamic environment, um, often um, caring for um, uh, five um, um, uh, young people with a range of vulnerabilities, um, with a large staff group, you are mashing a, a multiple households at any given point. Um, and therefore, it seems absolutely um, uh, sensible that they would be a priority both for vaccination, which is the, the, the live discussion, um, but also for regular testing. We have had some success uh, locally, um, uh, particularly where um, a young person has perhaps not been with stayed within the home as some of our young people are want to do and where there have been concerns we have been able to rapidly test that young person in order to inform the management um, around around the risks within uh, the home and as you said it is dynamic it is challenging and it's a staff group that absolutely deserve praise because I think um, you know I, I use the word courage I think they're incredibly courageous to leave their family homes their caring responsibilities often to, to children themselves to go into a home where there is perhaps some concern about the, the risk that, that that has taken place over the previous 24 hours 
then go back into their family home. Um, and so courage is the right word. And, and through vaccinations, I, I hope we can significantly reduce the risk within our residential settings. Um, you're absolutely right that there has been um, a, um, a healthy amount of reflection and challenge around promotion of family time. For exactly the same reasons, foster carers have children and young people within their homes. Um, and therefore, to uh, whilst there is permission for those children and young people to leave those homes to go and uh, see um, their birth family, that means they are meeting with another household. And for some of those um, families, we, uh, we're not entirely clear whether they have maintained um, appropriate social distancing and manage their risk um, appropriately. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I would say is, again, the absolute courage and support of foster carers um, to enable that to happen. Um, because at five o'clock, when a child or young person comes back from family time um, and the door opens, um, and they're welcomed back in with a, with a hug and um, and a cup of tea, and and that, that's that's an amazing achievement. And we've done that week in week out during during COVID. As I said, for a majority of us, our households have been closed and safe spaces. So as a as a foster care, I, I would just want uh, that you are just want to reflect how amazing that has been. Um, we have had to listen to foster carers. There will be some who've said the risk is just too great. We have found ourselves in some difficulty, um, members, in that um, we are often legally obliged to promote um, family time for children, particularly those temporarily in our care, understandably, because they are temporarily out of family uh, for safeguarding reasons, and we would want to maintain those links. We also have a staff group who, um, um, as well as foster carers, who are actively working with a range of children and young people on a given day. Um, and so I would say, and, and Vicky McLeod, who will present later, may want to, to, to make an observation because she manages the service. It has perhaps been our most complex area to manage during the pandemic um, to balance the absolute rights of children and young people to uh, maintain uh, quality time with their families and to manage the safety of the carers and staff, those transporting the children and young people and the safety of children and young people as well. Um, there has been a lot of um, regional discussion because one of the things that we have wanted to do is assure ourselves that our offer is no different than children and young people in, in Gateshead um, or South Tyneside. Um, and so one of the um, one of the things we've done as officers is to keep in close contact. We've also had to um, talk at length with the courts about their expectations. Not always the most helpful expectations um, at times. Um, and uh, we have had to take a pragmatic view of the court's expectation that um, family time would be um, five times a week, for example, with some with the reality of managing that with foster carers, the staff group. Um, we have been incredibly creative. We have used a range of council venues, uh, which has given us space to enable us to um, uh, socially distance. Um, we have used gallons of hand sanitizer, masks and and um, and, and, and various things uh, to continue. And I have to say, again, um, it's a matter of pride that throughout the pandemic, children and young people have had family time, may not be for as long or in the way that they would have had it had there been no pandemic. Um, but we have promoted it. We have also been able, of course, to use um, uh, uh, video conferencing in a way that I don't think officers had any awareness of the impact that the technology would give us so that we have been able to um, backfill some of the loss in physical face to face time with with more video conferencing as well. And, and children and young people have responded really appropriately to it. Thanks. Thanks for that Thank response. I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, Councillor Ad Newman had his hand up. Um, I'm assuming that you don't want to ask anything. Yeah, that's right, Chair. It's, uh, it's already been asked. That's great. Thanks. Um, Victoria McLeod wanted to come in. Um, I assume it was about Hive. Yes, it was a, <laughs> a few things that my colleague um, 
Nick is, is mentioned there. So Hive is for health information and advice, virtual school and emotional well-being. Um, was the was the, the first observation. The other one, just when we were talking about um, children, young people in education, I have been uh, alerted that this week one of our um, young people in care has been offered um, a place at Oxford University. Um, so we are feeling uh, immensely proud of his achievements this week, having sat the exam back in October of 2020. Um, and then finally, just the just my third observation is around family time. And just to say that it it has been a, a, a very complex area to manage um, and it is reviewed on a regular basis, very rigorously um, by balancing that duty of care that we do have to foster carers that we've also got to our workers, but also have to, to children and their families in terms of promoting that um, to the extent that even back during the summer, when we had some of those very um, rainy days, we'd bought gazebos so we could keep that um, maintained outdoors in the fresh air. And one of our workers was there holding on to the gazebo to stop it from blowing away. Um, but as Nick says, we have... Um, secured a, a number of buildings that are COVID secure now that are large that we can actually have family time in there so it has been um, although not without its challenges positive that we've maintained that thank you thank you Victoria um, do we have any other questions for Nick um, on this report or any comments you'd like to make Nick I have two questions um obviously the the economic impact of the the pandemic has been felt um by by millions of people across the country and is there any concerns that um people who are interested in fostering are doing it for the right reasons as opposed to a, a financial um incentive you know exacerbated by you know, a lot of the situations people will now find themselves in. I can be very candid and, and, and brief, Chair. And we have a robust fostering assessment process and anyone who came in simply for the financial um, reward of, of fostering would be weeded out. Um, whilst um, fostering um, is, is remunerated and uh, there has been a piece of work to make sure that um, the, the, the payments accurately uh, reflect or better reflect um, the, the, the effort and, and input of our foster carers, um, you need an absolute commitment to children and young people and a passion for them, as I'm sure the, 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 the councillor who is a foster carer would, would, would absolutely echo. Um, I think I would reframe it and say, I think the, the economic challenges, and particularly very sadly, if there has been a loss of employment, um, it may be that there are those who would be absolutely fantastic foster carers who would consider um, the, the career for the first time. And I think at, that's why I am keen that um, North Tyneside continues very actively to market itself and uh, to continue to recruit at this time. Yes, I, th I, th I think that's, that's a very important point that we actually do continue to um, look for foster carers because I think it's easy to criticise the council for not for, for doing it in these difficult times. But I think if the council wasn't doing it and we didn't have enough foster carers, the council would be criticised also. So I think it's actually a really good thing that the council's doing. Um, and my other question is regarding vaccinations. Has there been any conversations around um staff being vaccinated uh, you know priority because obviously it's it's quite a difficult profession in there i assume they're more vulnerable than than the average person um thank you chair um it's a very live live issue and um has there been discussion many many hours worth um we are at um we, we are at the discretion of the ccg who is obviously delivering on the um uh, delivering on uh, the vaccinations i'm i'm delighted to say that health and social care staff are a priority group 
outside of the the health and age needs uh, groups that we're all familiar with. Um, we uh, were asked to submit the staff who um, officers would most prioritise as in um, uh, as needing the vaccine. Um, and as has already been um, raised, clearly our, our residential children home staff and those staff promoting um, family time have been prioritised. A small number have been able to access it, but we um, we await daily the, the email. Um, I'm delighted to say that um, staff have, uh, a vast majority of staff have indicated their willingness to get the vaccine. Um, that will mean that they are, um, they are safer um, in the practice because we have carried significant risk, Chair, over, over the past um, nine, ten months in which we have um, maintained safeguarding and caring services within the borough in homes um, uh, for, for, um, for months. And it, it is just um, a delight that some staff can now continue their, 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 their employment with the additional safety that the vaccines provide. Um, I imagine it will be a number of months before all the staff who need the vaccine will uh, access the vaccine. That's great. That's really encouraging because I think that that's, that's how we get back to normal. I really do think um, it has to be a priority, especially in these, these statutory key services that actually things get back to normal. I know, I know we, we've stepped up, the council has stepped up and staff have stepped up, but we do need to get back to some sort of normality um, for the children we look after. Um, so unless there's any other questions um, or comments for Nick, I will ask Victoria. Um, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. We're on item six, which is the report on children's readiness for school subgroup. Um, I'm hoping people have had a chance to read it or at least the recommendations to cabinet. Does any member of the committee um, have any questions or comments or recommendations for change? I shall take silence as acceptance. Are we all happy to um, accept the report as it is? Could we get some confirmation? Yes, yes. Great, thank you. Yeah. Great. Yes. Um, the report will be going to overview and scrutiny and policy development on the 2nd of February. Um, assuming it's approved, which I hope it will be, um, it will then go to Cabinet and Cabinet will have two months to respond. Um, so hopefully they'll, they'll accept all the recommendations um, right, we can move on now. Victoria, you, you would like to, you are giving the the update on child sexual sexual exploitation. So, if it's okay, I would like to introduce um, Dawn Hodgson, who is the service manager and who has taken over um, responsibility in terms of um, our MSET processes. So, for that first part of the report, the review that we've undertaken, um, Dawn will take you through that. And then I'll come back in for the second part of the report just around our missing um, exploited um, and, and where we're at with that. Great, thank you. Can I just remind members to um, see if any questions on policy or any comments on policy towards the end, unless there's any clarification sought. Great, thank you, Dawn. Thank you, everyone. OK, so I'm just going to talk to our um, and provide an update um, to the committee in relation to child exploitation and the developments in um, North Tyneside. Um, so what, we, um, what we've done in North Tyneside is we have um, done quite a lot of work in um, it, starting from the back end of 2019 um, up until the current time. What we did is we, we knew going into, going into the review of, um, of this that we had a well-established um, multi-agency MSET arrangements um, which operate across the, the Northumbria Police area. Um, each local authority having their own MZ panel, um, which was chaired by a detective inspector for, for child abuse and protection. However, we did um, want to look at raising further awareness and updating and reviewing our, um, our policy around um, the MZ procedures. 
Um, what we did is we identified six areas of focus um, and we looked at the processes and the documents that we were using and we updated those in line with evidence-informed changes to the challenges faced by children and young people. Um, we also considered the, the risk assessment tool that we looked at um, and we wanted to align that with science safety, which is the model of practice that, that we're using um, in North Townside. And that was to allow consistency across the workforce. Um, we wanted to make sure that our referral pathways, uh, pathways were improved and they were very clear. Um, that the case management system could track and capture the recording of exploitation. Um, we needed to strengthen our um, strategic oversight of those arrangements. And we also wanted to raise um, awareness across the partnership and within the wider community as well. Um, so what we've what we've done in line with that is um, we have um, starting at the back end of 2019, we um, implemented a ta task and finish group to look look at and consider this. Um, there has been some delay um, with with this work, um, mainly down to COVID-19 and obviously everyone moving from being in the office and and being able to have those meetings face to face to, to doing virtual meetings and Obviously, our um, priority at the time was on dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic when that first um, arose. Um, so there has been a slight delay with things, but we're back on track with, with where we want to be. Um, so we've reviewed and we've relaunched the MSET strategic group. Um, we've scoped and designed a new multi-agency adolescent service. Now, that, that service will seek to reduce a range of risky behaviours and safeguard and worries outside of the family home. Um, and MSET will be the main referral route into that service. Um, we've reviewed our MSET process and the support documentation that was done in conjunction with other colleagues and other professionals um, from other services. Um, and that includes our policy, our report and governance, scrutiny and oversight, and also included the risk assessment form, which we, um, which we also updated. Um, we've developed um, awareness materials, so we've done some posters um, so that we can look at disseminating them across the community um, and partnership um, to, to make people more aware of, um, of the worries around um, exploited children. Um, we've introduced a specialist module into the social care data and recording system, so we use LCS. And that's our case management system. And we have aligned that with um, MSET. So we are able to um, extract performance data from that um, and a further, or it gives us a further understanding of, um, of children who are at risk of exploitation. Um, we've worked with our data team um, around developing an easy to understand MSET vulnerability data set. Um, We've also held um, workshops across children's services teams. So I've um, held a number of workshops around that, um, going into team meetings, et cetera, um, to look at ongoing improvement work and to um, talk through the processes of using the, the module in the, in the LCS system. Um, our new MSET processes have been agreed with police and they've been agreed with partners. Um, and it's also the that also has been approved through the Executive Partnership Board, um, which has oversight of North Townside Safeguard and Children's Partnership. So looking at next steps, uh, in terms of next steps, what we're doing is we are looking to launch our new MSEP processes in February 2021. And at the minute, we are considering a number of ways to do that. Obviously, um, COVID-19 has hindered that slightly, um, but we are looking at the best way to get that out to um, to staff, to the community, to the partnership and, and, and wider um, and wider professionals as well. Um, we need to make sure that everyone understands and can respond to MSET within North Townside. Um, just just re our adolescent service will also be launched um, and that um, they will um support children or young people who are at risk of being exploited or, or missing, trafficked and um, also slavery as well. Um, so I think, I'm just going to have a look, I think that's probably it for, for my part and then Vicky will talk you through, um, talk you through the, the examples of um, some of the cases that we've had recently.
Hi, so I'm just going to, to go over um, briefly the, the second part of the briefing note that we've provided to you, because what we do know is that um, in terms of um, child sexual exploitation, it doesn't usually happen within a vacuum. Um, it is linked into, into being missing or in, into other forms of exploitation. So I broke down the data and looked at the last quarter of 2020, because what we do know is since COVID, our instances of um, our children and young people being missing has reduced. Um, and that's been due to lockdown, due, due to the additional measures that families have been taking. So in, in the last quarter, we've had um, 84 instances of young people um, being missing. That related to 21 of our young people um, 17 of those returned in less than 24 hours, um, with the majority only being missing for a few hours. I think one of them was something like 45 minutes. So of that, the four young people who were longer than 24 hours, there was one young male who was missing for four, four days. Um, he's a, a very well-known, looked-after young person to us. Um, we are providing in, intensive support into that. Um, and this was a young man who spent a period of time in secure up in um, Glasgow. He moved out of their secure accommodation into a step down provision with the, the proviso that he was um, going to remain in the Glasgow area. And his mum, who we were currently assessing, was going to move up to that area. Um, what happened during that assessment period is mum disengaged with us um, we reviewed that plan and agreed that um, we would look at a, a planned move back into the North Tyneside area. So some of those um, periods of missing and the four days have involved him actually going back to the um, Glasgow area. So getting on a train, um, being sent funds from people that he knows in Glasgow and going up there. He advised us he's doing that because he wants to see them. Um, but some of the worries around that have been around his associates there, the um, the gang that we are worried that he was involved with whilst he was in Glasgow. So there's been some intensive work. We know that his uh, missing episodes have reduced slightly and that he's not going to Glasgow as much. Um, but we still have missing episodes, so we will continue to try and engage him. Our other three young people um, are, are females who are 16 and 17 year old. Um, they've had between one to three days of being missing. Um, however, and the whole when, when they have been found and when we've done return home interviews with them, they've either been found at the parents' house or they've been found um, at a friend's house when they've returned. So again, um, work undertaking to understand What's the current worries around them being at the parents' house? How can we disrupt um, the missing episodes? And what does that look like? Just moving on from that, during the same period of time from October to December, we've had one young person who has been in secure accommodation. Um, that was following a... a, a a large amount of worries about this young person that came out of the blue. Um, he had been doing really well up until this point, but when we discovered what had been happening, there was worries about him being criminally exploited and groomed by a gang who was very well known in Newcastle, where his mum resided. Um, we took the decision on, on him being found, and I provided the detail and, and where he was that we needed for his own safety and because of the, the risks around the gang that was being detailed to the police that we would seek a secure order. So he did spend a period of time in Newton Aycliffe. They'd done extensive work with him around um, safety. And he did come out of secure on the 31st of December. Um, he is not in North Tyneside. And this probably links back into some of the um, conversation around children who, who aren't in the area. He is just outside of the North Tyneside area and that is very much around safety but has a, a tight plan around him with a lot of support that's being done to continue to build on his knowledge and understanding of, of exploitation to, to be able to keep himself safe and for us to be able to keep him safe as well. 
in relation to our missing processes and exploitation, um, we have, now that we've finished with our MSET procedures, launched a very short task and finish group that is looking at um, our policies, our procedures, what's out there to support everybody in terms of of missing so information for foster carers around how they how they manage missing episodes for some of our young people who do go missing so we're reviewing all of those policies and and procedures reviewing the pathway that we have in in LCS to really try and strengthen that um and to be able to provide a full data set um that we can review on a regular basis that links everything together so missing um, exploited, trafficked slavery. So we will get a data set that encompasses all of that. So that task and finish group is happening now with the view that it will be done um, by March and a new policy and procedure that comes out. So in terms of MSET, I've detailed there around um, of the 30 of um, that, that quarterly period again, there was 13 cases referred in the pre, pre MSET. So pre-M sets the stage where actually they go in, where Dawn will sit on that. It's multi-agency game with the police chairing it. The information that's provided by the, the social worker will be considered and determined as whether it progresses to a full panel. So of those 13 cases, two progressed to full panel. Um, and on both of those occasions, it was in relation to the same um, young female who is in our care um, and and the support that could be made available from other professionals to, to look at how we can further keep her safe. And I think, I think that's probably about it, if there is any questions. Great, thank you, Victoria. I think, I think that's a very eye-opening um, report for the committee um, about actually the realities these children face and, and the, the members of staff who have to help them. Um, do we have any questions or comments on that report? Um, Councillor Sean Brockbank. Hi, hi, Vicky, um, and thanks very much for 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 the report. Um, I suppose my only and it was very um, very fulsome in what the local authority and the the other agencies are doing to keep our children safe. Um, I'm just curious uh, about what. How, how prevalent harbouring notices are in North Tyneside when we're trying to disrupt those activities. Because um, I, I am aware that the police sometimes find that on, on hugely keen on, on pursuing them. How, how prevalent is, is the use of that in disrupting criminal behaviour involving children in North Tyneside? Yeah, so, Councillor Brockbank, we certainly do utilise harbouring notice. So, some of the um, the developments, particularly in terms of MSET and what we proposed, is that we want to create disruption far sooner than waiting till we get to a pre MSET panel or to a full MSET panel and having the police say. Yeah. So, we 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 are now trying to do that disruption at the um, strategy meeting point, where we invite the police missing coordinator along. So we're not waiting till later in the process to, to, to be looking at harbouring notices as a way of disruption. So we do utilise harbouring notices and the police are, are, um, are, are very positive in the, in the use of them. We've never experienced any, any problems and certainly they are used. Great. And just one follow up question, if I could. Uh, how effective are they in, 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 in just in terms of trying to disrupt some of that behaviour and get, get, get children back to where they so, need to be? So I would say, um, on the whole, they are they are very effective and they are implemented. Um, every now and then we might come across one where it takes um, a little bit more of a nudge than just the harbouring notice. But yeah. again, the police are, are are very willing to work with us on that um, and are very supportive of that. OK, great. Thank you. No bother. Councillor Matt Wilson. Thank you, Chair, and uh, <clears throat> thank you for, for the report uh, and all those who are involved in producing it. Uh, obviously, the, the sort of the MSET work is um, right at that very sharp end of the most difficult end of, of safeguarding, and we, we, we respect and appreciate all you're doing there. Um, <clears throat> I, I confess to be a little bit 
concerned about the example um, of the, the young man who was sent into the secure accommodation in Glasgow. Um, and if I was following the story correctly there, it seemed that actually as a result of that, he'd become introduced to individuals and made associations that may have made his situation worse rather than better. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was misinterpreting that. And therefore, I just wondered around you know, when we do use these kind of um, provisions that are out of area, clearly there's going to be a an environment there where there is that possibility that an individual who may be vulnerable may meet other people and, and they find themselves in a completely different network of exploitation. Yes. So so the young person in particular around Glasgow, when he when he went to secure, that was now actually a, a couple of years ago. He's been in the step down provision for a for a little while. And the 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 reasons why he went to um, the secure was around um sexual exploitation in the first instance and the high level of risk that he was putting himself at, um, not just in North Tyneside, but other local authorities um, within the region. Um, the, the issues that came about while he was in Glasgow and the step down provision was very different to that. Um, but we know that he, he had gotten in with a group of other young people um, of, a, of a similar age um, and was going missing, which informed some of our decision making around that actually um, we aren't going to be able to secure him with his mum. His mum had disengaged from um, from the assessment process in terms of looking at that and how we managed that. Um, so we we made that determination that we needed to move him back to the North Tyneside area. Um, it had been more of a recent um, worry around him and the associates that they'd made up until um, more recently he'd been doing particularly well. Um, which was why we thought that man would be moving up to Glasgow, would be supporting um, some of the progress that he had made up there because he had um, settled in well. OK, thanks. I didn't want to go into too much detail on a specific case because on the whole, I mean, you know, what we're presented with here is that, you know, you're doing a, a fantastic job with actually, you know, a very difficult cohort of young people. And we, you know, we appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Nick, you want to come in? Uh, yes, I think I think I think Councillor put it very well. I think the wi the wider point is that um, we we would we would do absolutely use our discretion in relation to placing out of area because the levers that we have, the relationships we have with our police colleagues, those built relationships are lessened the further out. So it is in exceptional circumstances that we would make that decision. Having said that, for a small number of children and young people, we we that that we do place out of area. Clearly, there are positives to that, but there are also potentially negatives, and it is about that individual case planning. And I think the strength of MSET um, is, as well as the overall planning for a child or young person, there's a very narrow focus on mitigating the particular risks. Um, so that's why we would use MSET for, for those particular young people as well. And as um, Councillor Brockbank has, has, has alluded to, there are a range of levers and tools that we would we would use. Um, the harbour notice is to prevent a child or young person entering a house where we know there would be particular risks. But fundamentally, these are young people with lives to lead. And the artificiality of locks on the doors, which at times seems a very tempting to solution, particularly if they're out in our community doing things we wouldn't want them to do, has to be balanced with trying to encourage them to make better life choices. And therefore, the tension is always removing those choices entirely doesn't actually equip them and educate them. I think for many of us who've been parents, we will have that at a, a, at a very small level. But when we escalate in some of the significant levels of risk, um, it requires good quality multi-agency work. I know it's a truism and a horrible phrase, but it does. And the MSET framework gives us that position to meet regularly with particularly police colleagues about how we can keep children and young people in the community and not locked up out the way and coordinate risk management around the choices that they're making. Thank you, Nick. I think just on the on the note of, of secure, in, in terms of the use of secure accommodation, we don't have much of a say in terms of where that secure accommodation would be because there are so many 
um, or there's a limited amount of resources around secure accommodation, and it's a national um, registry who actually allocates those resources. So we we don't end up with one that would be in the area, um, unfortunately, on all occasions. Councillor Brockbank, do you want to come back in? Yeah, sorry, it's it's me again, Vicky. Um, just in terms of secure, just 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 for just for elected members, um, is it is it fair to say that 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 um, those sort of arrangements are quite exceptionally rare arrangements? It's not obviously not the first choice. And how many? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not you might not have this at the top of your head, but how many children are are, are securely accommodated by North Tyneside or by the courts at the moment? None. That's even better to know. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or any comments? Um, just to touch on what, what Nick was saying, I think it, 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 it should occur to members that actually there is a, there is a balance to strike um, between sort of the, the, the liberty and children and young people enjoy and, and actually ensuring they're safe. I think as, as long as, as we put the, the children at the heart, their best interests at heart, then I think actually, you know, things things will will work out. Um, so unless there's any other questions, I think that, that should conclude our meeting. Um, so I think it's just it's just time to say goodbye.